your time. So um, I'm, I mean, I'm someone who takes the demands of the youth very, very passionately. It's one of those things that when you actually meet me in the middle of the night and you just wake me up, it's, it feels like something that it's so, so, so inexhaustible. I mean, a lot of japa here and there. We can see how our youth are trying to just get out of their own motherland. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really, I mean, speak well. Within the last four to seven years thereabout, we've had a situation where we feel like we're living in <laughs> in a country that we can't even recognize again. For some of us who are, are not really very much like holding within the last seven years, the only Nigeria we know now is a Nigeria that is a very, very inhabitable. So I have here with me Dr. Chidi too, and then I'm, I'm just wondering, Dr. Chidi, yeah. um, there is no gain saying that some of us, we've seen an expression with um, His Excellency, uh, Governor Peter Obi, but we still want to know, like what are those, Things like as a, as, a, as a young Nigeria, what, what does the what does the future hold for me? What do I have to look up to? I mean, during the administration of His Excellency, should we get to power in in May? Yeah, and when His Excellency talks about moving Nigeria from consumption to production, is when all the ac in sectors of production is activated, the youth will be engaged. Oh yeah, the agricultural sector manufacturing sector, entrepreneurship, and all that. You see, um, the, His Excellency is coming up with every youth a skill program, whereby no Nigerian youth will be left out of the job sector. Every youth a skill, make sure that every youth is engaged in one form or the other. As a matter of fact, there is no useless human being. We will have are people that are not skilled. So His Excellency is going to take a very determined step to ensure that every Nigerian child learns one or two skills that could help him earn a living in life. Remember he was talking about the 20 million out of school children, most of them in the north. And he said, look, if these kids can learn Quran, then they can learn anything else. Therefore, why don't we engage them in some life skills that will help them earn a living? Every human being can earn a living for himself and by himself if he's appropriately trained to okay. do that. There is one area that usually strikes me. I mean, this is one thing I've always been saying. No, if I am sitting down across the table with whoever wants to be the next president of Nigeria, is the, is the question of the minimum wage for the youth. Of course. No, not for the youth for, per se. I in looked the, at in our country. In our country. Yeah. The, the question of minimum wage. Okay, so we have someone who is just 21 years old now is going into the, um, the, the employment industry mm -hmm. and then it's basically asking the basic minimum wage is 30,000 naira. And as a young person, perhaps be probably you've been through school for like four or five years. We saw what they did with some very funny program within the last seven years. They call it, I don't want to mention the name, but they are not basically empowering us. So what does the future hold? What does the next administration hold for? For us, what do they have in terms of minimum wage? What can we look up to? Yeah, the His Excellency has talked so much about paying Nigerians living wages. You see... The truth of the matter is that we have not come to understand that every human being would make a living out of the current job he has. If someone lives on 100,000 a month and you pay him 30,000, he's going to make the, different, the, the difference, the 70,000 difference from that job. This is one of the major things that is for corruption. I remember when Prof was talking in, on, on the security platform, he talked about the police. How do you give a man a gun and you pay him less than 100000 a month and you expect him to respect the citizens he's supposed to protect? So part of the things we, His Excellency is bringing to the, on board is the hourly wage and paying Nigerians living wages. Wages that are adjusted to the inflationary rate. You know someone that, that, that was earning 30000 a month in 2015 is actually not earning 30000 a month this year because of the inflation. You have over 20% inflation rate and you're paying people the same rate you were paying them when exchange rate was, um, was $290. Today exchange rate is $700 something in the black market and you see paying people the same rate. Of course, 
most Nigerians, their wages can't take them home. And part of the things the government will do is, if you really want to fight corruption, you must pay people living wages. Okay, so, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's one thing that I always feel like, because no investor will come to your country if um, people can't even afford their products. Yeah. So, purchasing power it's has important. to be something that we need to actually look at. Yeah. And you have to start from this particular wage. So, I'm going to look at it from, okay, so now we have that particular side of the supply side. I mean, or the demand side. Then let's look at the job creation side. Now, you've mentioned the skill, yep. but then, of course, if I have a skill and then I have to look at that particular uh, supply side, I'll be able to say, okay, these skilled people, they are going to come. We're going to talk about skills much better. I mean, in the, in the, because I want to actually get that idea of small business or probably youth business entrepreneurship. What are, the, what, what are your thoughts on this particular area? I think I, I do have some, some of my own thoughts, but I still feel I want to actually get your thoughts as it were. What are those things? What are those concrete and very I mean, appropriate programs that you feel that, okay, these are the basic things to say, youth out there, because these are very, very important to the youth. We have a lot of youth who cannot find jobs, and it's not always the case that they don't have skill. So, we, and like I've said, we're going to talk about the skill. Now, you have a, a, a young person. So, we have some youths who, um, they want to be gainfully employed. But we have some youths who are ready to actually create jobs for the other. So, I mean, I want to be able to say, okay, so if you have someone who wants to create a job, and you have someone who wants, to, who wants to get a job, then it's only normal, it's only appropriate that we should have uh, it's sort of like a very, very determined government policy for those who are ready to create the job. And when I mean policies, I mean some steps of policies okay. that will not just be basically on funding, but also in, in terms of governance of the funding, because within the last seven years, we have, we've had, we've, we're having a series of funding. Okay, we're having some series of fundings that the government have been coming up with. But then, of course, it seems that these fundings are not appropriate. Because, okay, apart from the fact that the funding might not be much, but then we also have the situation where they are giving this funding wrongly. Do you understand? Okay, can, okay let me let me get let me get let me get David's thoughts on some of this area. You get let me get David's thoughts. David, please, I would like to get your thoughts on the area of uh, what do you think about business funding for the young people? What are your thoughts basically on how you feel government should have a strategy of funding for the young people? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not sure why it's not letting me um, show my video. M maybe the host wants to sort that out. But anyway, let's let's get to it. So, um, I saw a, a few days ago that there was a there was a bill that was actually thrown out of the House of Representatives. A bill that I thought was it was potentially a very good bill that uh, was essentially trying to make the um, National Youth Service Corps program optional. And that in the absence of it being um, a mandatory program, as it is now, that um, young Nigerians should instead be given the opportunity to use that funding that would otherwise be used by the government to enroll them in the NYC program to start businesses. So it was essentially going to turn what is currently the NYC into probably Africa's largest um, small business accelerator. I thought that was a brilliant idea. But for whatever reason, it's been thrown out of the house. Right, the the house, um, the house basically um, had a big problem with it, and the the issue that the house raised with it was obviously that um, basically there are a number of states in Nigeria that use the, the existing NYSE program as a technical subsidy for the education and health sector because they don't want to invest in those things, so they'd rather use young Nigerians as cheap labor, as a sticking plaster. So instead of solving the long term problem, which is that you don't have enough qualified teachers and doctors in your state, and you don't want to make the investments necessary to put that into place. You'd rather just have uh, young Nigerians coming in every year, a steady stream of young Nigerians coming in every year, and you pay them peanuts, and they're obligated to do it. They have to do it by law. And, you know, even the, 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 the deteriorating security situation and the risk that that puts them in, you don't care, because all you're looking for is your own advantage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this, this illustrates just that basic disconnect that exists in the way a, 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 a Peter will be and the way the political establishment sees the future of Nigeria. Mm. Now, when it comes to business funding, 
and business acceleration. A simple look at the population demographics of Nigeria should tell you, should tell you something very simple. Something like 65% of Nigeria's population is under the age of 35. Mm, that's true. Statistically, Nigeria is one of the youngest countries in the world. Our median age is something like 18.9. Very young, demographically. What that means is that we are on the cusp of something called a demographic dividend. A demographic dividend is basically when the majority, the vast majority of the country's population is within the, um, the, the, a, the young working age. Yeah. So between 18 and 40. That's a demographic dividend. Typically, when countries go through demographic dividends, they are supposed to enjoy explosive rates of economic growth. So when China and India in the 80s and 90s experienced their economic booms, they were passing through their demographic dividend. Nigeria is about to enter its demographic dividend, and it should be common, it should be clear to, to everyone that um, being that they aren't, we don't really have that much of the, the large structured um, formal sector, the vast majority of Nigeria's economy is informal. Something like 60% of Nigerians are employed in the informal sector. So the only way to properly harness this demographic dividend and enjoy the economic results of a demographic dividend is to um, encourage growth and expansion of small businesses. That's the only way it's going to happen. Okay. That's the only way the, the economy is going to develop that heat and friction that it needs to drive Nigeria into the 21st century. You take advantage of your youth population and do uh, put in the investment it takes to get them to grow the economy, to grow businesses and, by extension, grow the economy. And that's how you take advantage of the demographic dividend. Not by distributing, you know, you, you referenced the NPAR program, you know, distributing 10,000 naira every few months to people, you know, that's, that does nothing. All that does is that it funds a little bit of consumption. It does nothing more than that. It will buy food for a few days and that's it that is not what young david wait a, a little bit Nigeria's... sorry wait um can you turn on your video now i think you can come up now okay perfect so as i was saying what what young nigerians need is um the opportunity to grow their economy and young nigerians have already demonstrated the, the capacity to develop and to grow business what young nigerians do not need categorically do not need is um, just these little subsidies to fund consumption. So these um, electoral bribes, which we refer to euphemistically as anchor borrowers program, uh, end power, whichever fan fancy name you used to cover it, which is basically basically very tiny sums of money, which are essentially yeah, just little into my bribes mind. to poor people. You know, so that, you your, that you is not what young means. Nigerians need. Something young just Nigerians need to you. me. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, no, something just occurred to me. I mean, I mean you are the very, very well-respected investigative journalist here. Did you think there is an iota of truth to the 75 trillion Naira stamp duties? I'm, I'm getting somewhere because, you see, I have this very crazy idea about how we can fund the youth business. And I've discussed with my role model, Professor Patu Tommy, and he has never considered it very crazy. But then, of course, when I talk to other people, they think, I feel, me personally, I feel we should have a yearly 20 trillion Naira youth business development fund. And then people will ask me, how do we fund this? So understanding this, let us look, go into the area of the, uh, the, um, the so, sorry, the um, stamp duty. Is there any iota of truth in the very fact that we have we have a situation where we have 75 trillion naira unremitted stamp duties. Is there any truth there? Maybe probably I can then go to... Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Is well, there so anything... I don't, I don't do you, do you think it is true? 75 trillion, that's a, that's a very large figure. Be, being that Nigeria's annual, annual, total annual budget is just about 7 or 8 trillion. So I'm not sure 75 trillion is a realistic number. As if you are telling 75 billion, maybe. And by the way, I don't doubt that there's definitely some level of corruption going on in, in the stamp duty remittances. It's the amounts that I'm not too sure about. But going on to your point about the, the possibility of funding basically a nationwide uh, business accelerator program, I think this is not just a good idea. I think it has actually been done before. So if you recall, under the previous administration, there was something called the uh, UWIN, right? Now, for whatever reason, this either that administration didn't make 
um, as much of, of, of the meal about it as it should have, or this, or the media didn't do its job. But this was actually rated by, I believe, the World Bank at the time as one of the most successful government-driven business, business accelerator programs ever on the African continent. And why was it successful? The simple reason was that the government itself wasn't directly in charge of administering it. So the government funded the program and then hired your um, corporate consultancies like KPMG to actually manage the actual day-to-day -day process of selecting people, you know, uh, judging um, uh, business plans, that sort of thing. So the decisions were made purely on a business level. They weren't, they weren't political decisions. So it wasn't influenced by where this person comes from, uh, who sent a letter on behalf of this person, who this person's child is. And as a result, that was a fairly successful program. So I believe something like that can actually be done and scaled up using, using a similar model where the government itself isn't directly in charge of making funding decisions. And uh, the, the, the application of funding process is, is privately driven and it's, um, it's transparent so that people have a, signif a, uh, a, a significant amount of trust in it. I think if that can be done, that definitely could be a solution, one of the solutions to this uh, long, long-term problem of youth unemployment and underemployment. Private sector, and I believe that um, the best approach to monitor uh, funding disbursed, for me, I believe in equity structure. I really do not believe in grants very much, and I don't believe very much in loan. But I believe that if you give money, if I, I'm going to give my wife money to start business. I think I want to do it in terms of equity so that I will be able to monitor the business because I'm now a part owner of this business. So I can actually yeah. set up some kind of governance structure into this. Then if you have an effective governance structure, an effective uh, system of that kind of thing, then you can actually then talk to angels. There are thousands and thousands of angels across the world who actually want to um, invest in young businesses. By the way, before I actually, I mean, before we continue, please do, uh, do uh, well to donate to the account over there. I mean, we, we, we very much love um, to, to get your donation. So David, I'm, I'm going, I mean, let, let me get back to you. Well, I mean, let, but let me go to Dr. Chidi, for instance. For Dr. Chidi, what are the basic governance uh, approach to, for me, like I've said, loan is good, grant is good, but I actually love equity. I love a situation where if I want to invest in your business, it's not because I want to pry into your business, but I want to invest there so that I can actually monitor it. So what are your thoughts on that kind of funding structure? For me, it is not something we cannot do. There are thousands and millions of angels out there who wants to actually invest. What they are just interested in is that they have, there's a particular, there's a very strong and a very efficient uh, governance structure in order to monitor the young businesses that we're actually talking about. What are your thoughts on this particular area for our, for the Obidati administration should we actually come in in May? Yeah, I think we are starting with bringing in transformation in the way government agencies operate. One, as of today, most of the government agencies operate as enforcers of the law, not enablers of businesses. These are two very different things. When the agencies of governance begins to work like enablers, business enablers, for instance, NAVDAC will begin to work as enabling small businesses to develop standards that are acceptable to the international community and not enforcing them to do that. Some will begin to be, become an enabler of small business to meet the international standards for, the, for their products. Okay. A lot of things will change. Now, there are so many government agencies that have been established to support businesses. But the bureaucracy that is involved and the corruption that is involved is what makes us not work. If you look at what David Hinde said, now, government, the past government of Jonathan, I think what they did was to contract a private sector, KPNG, to manage that processes. Because when the government comes in and the processes are compromised, quality, competence, and capability is not taken into consideration, everything fails. The moment you, you do not consider the competence, the capacity, and the quality of the business plan, then the money might have gone right to, to the wrong person. So okay. this government is coming in to equip all the, gov all the institutions, um, development institutions, like the Bank of Industry, like the Development Bank, 
by the Bank of Agriculture to get them to begin to do the work they were established to do. Put in right, right people in those places who understand their responsibility but and their roles. Most importantly, like David was trying to say, it is the fact that the private sector must still play the key role no, you're, in you're the coming governance. Back, you're, you're, you're coming back to the private sector. Now, part of the reason why a lot of people investment are not coming to the private sector is because you don't have a rule of, rule of law. Part of the things of, uh, the presidency is bringing to play is rule of law, establishing a rule of law, and ensuring that every case that goes to the Nigerian court is complete, concluded within 12 months. No case should exceed 12 months. So if we have a, a dispute and we go to court, it shouldn't la be there for 10, 20 years. And when people know that if I have a, a, a disagreement or misunderstanding, business misunderstanding with you, I can go to court and get, and get justice, then I will be comfortable with investing money in that. And then a lot of things will happen. When you create a conducive environment for businesses to thrive, and knowledge is celebrated. Right now in Nigeria, knowledge is not celebrated. That, that's why people don't, creative industry is not growing at the rate it should grow, because knowledge is not celebrated. Sorry, let me, let me, let me get David's thoughts. David, please, uh, on yes. the area of small businesses and funding small businesses, as um, someone who has been involved in business yourself, and you know how difficult it is to actually grow business. What kind of governance structure would you want? I mean, if I give 10 million naira to business now, I'm actually, uh, I, I, I run a fund, and when I give 10 million naira to a small business or to a startup, I know the sort of governance infrastructure that I must put in place. What are the kind of governance infrastructure that you feel, based on your experience, something we can actually learn from and say, okay, if I had not, this, this is a mistake I, I mean, I've, I've made. So if there is a, a sort of like a young panel of young business person like you that have been successful with what you're trying to do, what are the kind of processes you feel government, working together with government and then having a sort of like a private sector uh, governance infrastructure, what, what kind of structure would you like to see in those uh, kind of uh, regard? So um, I'm not exactly a business guru. I, I only have some experience in running a small business, so um, I will speak based on the little experience that I have with all humility. Um, I, I would say the, the going from the mistakes that I made when, when I was running a copywriting agency back in 2019, what I would say is the number one thing that you want to do is make sure that as a business owner, you have someone that you are accountable to. Because it's very easy to, um, if you have what you think of as a successful business, you the cash flow is good, you have money coming in, it's very easy to forget that you and your business are supposed to be two separate entities. And your personal funds and your business funds are not supposed to commingle. You are supposed to pay yourself a salary. There's supposed to be that separation and discipline, right? Um, it, I personally made that mistake quite a number of times. So for the purpose of taxes, for the purpose of even sustainability of the business, there needs to be someone you're accountable to. So what I would recommend is that instead of the usual sole proprietorship model, um, if, even though it costs a bit more and there's a bit more legal paperwork involved, um, people should look more into uh, uh, a limited liability sort of structure with a board so that there are people that one is responsible to. So that even if one is essential executive personnel in the, in the business, um, one, for example, doesn't have free reign to just dip one's hands into the company accounts as and when one one pleases, that one has someone um, always sort of uh, keeping one honest, keeping one um, uh, accountable that this month you have to make payroll, so and such and such has to happen, and that no matter what, you cannot redraw more than so and so amount from, from the business. Because in, from my experience, a very large part of the reason why so many, most young businesses fail to make it past three years it's not necessarily because the business proposition is bad. It's not necessarily because there's a cash flow problem or there's a, there's a consumer problem. It's simply because the business owners um, are not sufficiently, um, uh, do not have the, the requisite discipline or skill to keep a business running. Because uh, keep running a business and having the skill set, the skill set required to offer a, a service or a commodity for sale are not the same thing. And that's that. That was my own experience. 
That was what I mean. So now we have um, uh, the, the governance and then the skill sets. And then that will take me back to the youth skill set that you actually talk about. Now, David, will I mean, an idea like uh, incubation centers, maybe probably one in local government, what do you think about this kind of thing? You know, for me, I feel in a community, if you look at a community, for instance, there will be lots of people within that community that are gifted, right? Or maybe probably yeah. there will be lots of people that needed that particular skill set, maybe entrepreneurship or employability training. What would you think about the idea of uh, the incubation centers? Like, um, I mean, where youth can actually say, okay, if I need to actually learn something, if I need to actually get funding, if I need to actually become a, a small business owner, I would actually, I mean, there's a place I can actually go to. What would that kind of thought, I mean, how will it go in your mind? What would you want? I so mean, is, is there something that there, actually... There are actually, there are actually such things that already exist. Um, I don't know if you know about an organization called the Seed Stars. So they run a global network of such incubation centers. They're trying to expand across Africa and across Nigeria as well. Um, so far, they only have a space in Lagos and I think Abuja, but they're also trying to expand. How I think a government would key into this would be, obviously, there will be a significant amount of government funding involved, right? The government has to invest in this. But very crucially, instead of it being government property, the government should rather partner with a private sector entity like Seed Space, right? So the government will have equity in that joint venture and then let the private sector drive that thing. So there can be a bit of, you know, government uh, incentivization involved. So for example, where in places where it may not necessarily be that viable to cite um, an innovation center or an, or an accelerator, maybe because the skilled population maybe isn't really there, but for the purpose of government presence, um, it would be expedient to put it there. Um, such things might might be possible. So the government is the one putting up the money, right? But it's driven by the private sector. The day-to-day -day operation is driven by the private sector. So such that, because if you leave it completely to the private sector, what tends to happen and what has happened elsewhere is that everything gets centralized in one or two places. So the private sector obviously will go straight to Lagos and then everything will get centralized in Lagos and then everybody keeps on coming into Lagos. Like, that's not really how to grow an economy, right? Even though it's good to have a hub like Lagos where you can access everything. But bear in mind, Nigeria is a country of close to 200 million people. So you can't have 200 million people in Lagos and Abuja alone. So you need to have five, six, seven other you know, mid to large sized viable cities, which have their own, you know, large economies too. So you, you need to have such things in Ibado, you need to have such things in Benin, in Kano, in Port Harcourt, in Wari, in, you know, that kind of thing, in, in Enugu, in Onicha. So how, how a government would key into this would be to put up the required funding, but going through the private sector, I can't stress that enough, because if the government tries to go it alone, it just becomes yet another Nigerian government um, scheme, yet another subsidy, right? And we know, we, we know what the history of that is. Sorry, uh, Nigeria, David, so. David, your thoughts. A lot of ideas has been discussed around this. And I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion that um, if you really want to develop the, the people, for me personally, I think, um, and I've discussed it extensively with Professor, I mean, Professor Pato Tommy, very great concept. We want to be able to say, look, can we have this incubation? They don't have to have the same characteristics. Okay, let me come in here okay, now. Okay, exactly. What so that's what Prof called um, fact, local factor endowment. Now, you want to set up an incubation center, for instance, in Kano. You're not going to say this any type of incubation center in Aba. They have different local uh, factor endowment. In Kano, you could set up incubation center on businesses surrounding meat processing high science skin and all that. Maybe in another place, you say about incubation center about rice production and processing and all that. And another, in Abba, you set up incubation center for, for garment making, for shoe making and all that. So we take into consideration the local factor endowment in that area and then set up incubation center that serve that local factor endowment. That way, you even reduce the urban migration. For people, people don't need to live where they're living. They can do that thing from their own local environment. So you can then have a sort of like an industrial cluster yes, around in that every, particular yes, value every, chain. Every duplicate zone. I mean, David, I mean, this is something that I feel basically that it's a no-brainer that the government should actually think about this. It's something we shouldn't have to be talking about in 2023. But then, of course, it's good. 
the most important thing is that there is a government here that is here and is care to listen. So in other words, now tying this whole incubation centers with the funding that we've talked about and then bringing it back home to that area of skill, then it, means, it then means that if there is a particular incubation hub around, say, rice processing and as it were. It then means that we're going to have to provide the requisite skills in that area to the young people in that, around, in, in in that, that particular local, environment. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. David, David, I mean, what are your thoughts on this kind of uh, situation? I mean, this, what, what, what they just mentioned, this is a very, very, very great uh, idea around localizing incubation centers within a particular area. And based, it, on their based, on their based on their factual endowments. Based on their factual endowments. Will that solve the problem of this over-clusterization of incubation? Or because I can, I mean, I'm aware of more than 20, if not 50, around the Abba alone. And a whole lot of them are trying to struggle to, 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 for, for office spaces. Meanwhile, there are a lot exactly. of youth in the villages. So, I mean, this is actually a very, very great um, uh, um, um, stop. So, it then means that we need to actually have a sort of like a database of, for me, it's just, you know, my eye. Well, we already know what every, every local environment in Nigeria, what they are strong in. It's just to look at that thing and set up a business incubation center that that takes advantage of that env en endowment in that environment. I, I I completely align with that. I completely agree with that. And um, what I'll just add to that is that this this feeds into um, something which if a few people who um, who are active in the the economic policy space in Nigeria have been trying to um, stress over the past seven years, especially that. In economics, there's something called uh, comparative advantage. And that it seems as if the Nigerian government um, is determined to ignore the existence of comparative advantage, which is why, um, for example, when, when you see the, 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 uh, the, the Nigerian borders being closed, land borders being closed, because somebody believed that um, it was it to stop the importation of rice, which would then somehow boost local production of rice. Meanwhile, there is no evidence that Nigeria has a comparative advantage in rice production as it stands. So instead, all that happened was that rice prices went up for everybody. Inflation went, food inflation went up, and everybody's standard of living declined as a result because they don't take notes or cognizance of comparative advantage. So that what you've just described is basically comparative advantage, but within the country that um, when, when setting up uh, 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 the business accelerator hubs or you know uh, industrial parks whatever those things are that it's very important to take the local context into account and the reason one of the well not a reason but an, ob an observation that i've made is that uh seed stars for example which i mentioned earlier which i've been trying to expand they seem very focused on just tech alone so the idea is we're going to go around Africa, and we're just going to start building tech accelerator hubs so that everybody in Africa is going to learn how to code. David, please, um, no, well, that's, let, that's let me hold your thoughts for a minute. Let me hold your thoughts for a minute. The question of, uh, or the demands of the youth, it's something we cannot exhaust. Believe me, there are so many thoughts in my mind. So, so many things going on. I mean, if you can see, I'm not really, really like settled. If you give me three hours, it's not something I can exhaust, believe me. And so in that very short period of time, I'm trying to cramp everything. But I'm very, very glad we could be able to look at the area of industrial clusters and trying to have characteristics in the manner in which we have incubation up so that it will not look like the business as usual. And then in the area of the funding, we've been able to touch on that. But then, of course, we cannot exhaust it. So I'm going to have to uh, let you uh, go for now. But I hope it's something we could actually catch up on, on later. But I have with me in the studio my prof. Okay. So, sir, what are your thoughts generally? We've talked about the funding. We've talked about the governance. We've talked about the incubation centers. But then, of course, I, I mean, I know so much. We've, we've discussed so much. Very, very much, yeah. and there is a lot. We we'll spent many hours talking about these things. Uh, <clears throat> David is a remarkable example of a very thoughtful person who applies ideas to experience in a way that this flew out. I mean, he made the point about the simple uh, uh, idea of comparative advantage. Today, in structural economics, they look at latent comparative advantage. Uh, because you can use industrial pol policy to accelerate a comparative advantage in building uh, uh, value chains. But let's not talk that kind of grammar uh, right now. <laughs> uh, uh, um, 
I, I just want to leave everybody with a shocking thought. We can make every 21-year-old Nigerian a millionaire within 15 months of a new government. No. <laughs> That's not possible. Ha! <laughs> I expect that to shock you, but... <laughs> That's not possible. It's true. The accountant general, how much did they say... It took. It took. 107 billion. Whatever billion, but it's billion, 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 billion. 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 Okay. Seven billion. You know, in this government, we've been having billions. Uh -huh. And at the point, we're having trillions. So, so, me uh, and let me take that idea just a little further, so that people don't feel scandalized that I say we can make every 21-year-old a millionaire in 15 months. You know, in 2003, uh, two um, professors of economics at Columbia University, Avin Subramanian, and Javier Salah Martin wrote a working paper for the IMF in which they said that the government of Nigeria was so incompetent that Nigerians would be better off without the government. Hmm. As an IMF working paper, I'm not... That is, if you take the welfare that Nigerians get out of their being governed and just don't have a government, just say, okay, these are Nigerian revenues, 100 billion. Okay, all of you, your share is so much. Nigerians would be better off. Hmm. That was their thesis. Now, a friend of mine, who was a Norwegian-born economist at Harvard at the time, later moved to Colombia, where these people wrote out of, and is currently an editor of the Financial Times in London, Martin Sambu, took the concept a little further. Martin argues that essentially, why Nigeria is badly governed is that the people don't know that the money that they are playing with in Abuja is their money. Yeah. That if you collected all of Nigeria's revenues, wrote to the Sorosuke ch champions, all of them, and said, look, oh, your share of this Nigerian money is 20 million naira for 2023. <coughs> My money. <laughs> but they won't give it to you now. See, we are going to tax you at the rate of 99.9%. So what is left in your account will be 50,000 Naira. You can go and spend it as you like, but we've taxed you at this rate and we've taken 20, 19 point something million. You see people will get ready to fight. Yes. How can you take all of that my money like that? Absolutely. <laughs> and the money will then be utilized in a way that makes your life much, much better. In the United States, a state called Alaska, the certain, in a certain month of the year, sends out um, uh, checks to every citizen as their share of oil revenues. Hmm. In Canada, Alberta does it. Hmm. In Nigeria, a few big men steal it and leave you poor. Even when they spend it, they spend it in a way that will make you poor. And so he has a simple idea. It's funny, I've been thinking about it, talking about it. Some guy walks into my office and says to me, look, get 20 banks. Credit every Nigerian with this, from this revenue, the basic idea of Martin Sambu. Um, 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 Liko, uh, where's your account? First City Machan Bank. Okay, we're going to pay 20 million Naira, your entitlement. Ah, but we want to make sure every child goes to school. And so, the son's school fees were deducting 800,000, whatever it is. From that 20 million, that's your money for your school school fees. For this, I'm going to do, we're going to deduct. After you've deducted everything, you still have 1.5 million left in your yeah. accounts. And you can spend it as you will. And you'll be taxed as you spend it. We can make every 21-year-old Nigerian a billionaire, a millionaire, within one year of this administration, if people are just going to be serious. So let them not deceive you. Nigeria is poor because Nigeria is run poorly. And the youth can change it and take that into an entrepreneurial uh, uh, engagement that will change everything for the Nigerian people. Let me leave that thought. You want to be a millionaire? Vote right. 
15 months from now, you'll be a millionaire. And we shall do. We shall vote. Thank you so much, Prof. Yeah, I mean, welcome. it's been quite enlightening. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Chidi, thank you so much. 